Okay, well, we're live on YouTube. Uh, okay, welcome um, to this evening's thing here at the Marks Memorial Library. I'm Marion Jump, I'm the director here at the MML, and it's an absolute pleasure um, to be working with the Morning Star and Friends of Socialist China to put on this evening's dialogue. I'm just going to cover some housekeeping really briefly. Um, we're really pleased that we've got obviously a site, but we're also joined online on Zoom and we're live on YouTube. Um, so this means speaking to link so we can upload the video as a kind of last resource on our website. Um, and there will, of course, be a chance um, to contribute questions. Uh, so if you're joining us online through Zoom, you'll be able to raise your virtual hand and I'll keep an eye out and bring you in. Um, and we'll have a little roving microphone that um, my friend Simon Renton will be running around with. From me on the housekeeping front. Thank you very much. Good evening, wherever you are. Good morning, good afternoon. Welcome everyone. So my job today, two minutes, two, three minutes, according to Carlos, to introduce, you know, um, our facilitator, Roger McKenzie, he, he, or pronouns, he or they, or? Today, I'm going to be a he. Today is a he. Yeah. So he is an international editor of Morning Staff. And I want to say thank you to my friend, Keith Brennett, invite me to this event. Why I'm here, because I think we all know nowadays, especially in the last five years, all this new Cold War, anti-China propaganda, we are so desperate, need another perspective to balance all this gaslighting news or narrative. So I am going to hand it over to you, but just a reminder um, to everyone, this event is recorded, so behave. <laughs> Yeah, no, no, normally when there's a, a kind of thing about, there you go. normally when there's a thing about telling somebody to behave, it's usually about me. So um, I'll do my best um, today. So I'm I'm really really delighted to um, to be. Um, I'm, t I'm told I was I'm the moderator, and it's the very first time I've done anything moderately. Um, I, I believe. <laughs> Um, although others in unison when I was there might say something different, but anyway, not for me. Um, so clearly, um, there's nothing been happening um, about China in the last few days. Um, clearly nothing. Um, even today, um, I had a few emails off people um, who've kind of questioned um, our coverage um, in the Morning Star. I, I don't think we've got anything to and be worried about with our coverage. Um, I think we do what we always do, which is um, tell the news um, properly, um, but also reminding everybody that at the title of our paper, um, it says for peace and socialism, because that's what we're about um, at the Morning Star, and we're proud of that too. Um, so my job this evening is to introduce um, our two uh, guest speakers and then to facilitate a bit of a discussion, um, question and answer, but also hopefully um, a discussion um, as well. Um, and, and the aim of, um, for us this evening is to finish by about 8.30 um, at, the, at the latest. Um, so I know these things can and have in the past kind of <laughs> gone on all night and day and stuff, but that's not what we're going to do. Uh, this evening. So can I first of all introduce um, our um, guest speakers. Um, we've got Ken Hammond, Professor Ken Hammond, um, who's a professor of East Asian history at New Mexico State University. Um, he's also part of Pivot for Peace, um, and um, which is an organization that um, opposes American um, expansionism, imperialism, and the rest. And he's also um, Ken is a member of part, the, the Party for Socialism and Liberation. Um, and our second guest speaker um, is Andrew Murray, um, familiar to many, I'm sure, in the room, former chair of Stop the War Coalition, 
um, former chief of staff at United told me that there was lots of formers in there, so I'm to say <laughs> something that was current. He's a current columnist um, for the for the Morning Star um, as well. So I'm delighted to to welcome you both. And um, so you don't have to listen to to me going on because that's not my role tonight. I'm going to pass straight on to um, to Ken to um, move into your contribution. Please welcome Ken. <laughs> Well, it's a delight to be here. Um, I've been familiar with the Marks Memorial Library for a while, and I've been here doing some research over the last month. Uh, so it's uh, it's great to to come and take part in this event, and of course, working with Carlos and Keith with Friends of Socialist China. I've been doing that for a while. Uh, that's all been uh, very delightful as well, having a chance to be here in London, a little bit away from the deserts of New Mexico. It's uh, the weather is very different here, so, <laughs> which you're probably all tired of, but is very refreshing for some of us. Um, so we're to talk tonight about uh, the significance of the Chinese Revolution, which I think basically must must mean what the heck is with China these days? You know, uh, we've had this revolution. It's been 70 some years since the revolution succeeded and, and established the People's Republic. And of course, that's a that's a long and complex history, both before and after that a critical event. Um, but uh, as was uh, alluded to a moment ago, China certainly is very much in the news these days. It's uh, it's always uh, a, a focus of, uh, of contention, shall we say. Uh, I don't think there's any surprise probably on the part of most people in this room that that the bourgeois media delights in anything they can possibly say or make up uh, about China that's that's critical and negative. Uh, and so one of the great tasks that uh, those of us who, who are socialists and communists and fighters for change in the world need to address ourselves to is what is uh, the nature of uh, the Chinese state and society and economy these days? Where is China going? Uh, and uh, and how does that relate to to our larger struggles in our in our various home countries and, and internationally um, as well? So, in thinking about that, one of one of the things that I think is most important to sort of start with and to always bear in mind is simply that that China is a real place. Uh, it's not an abstraction. It's not an ideal. Uh, it is a it is a huge country, 1.4 billion people, a territory equal to that of the United States, uh, and of course, as as is such a uh, kind of it's it's a trite but true uh, saying that uh, that one hears all the time about China. It's 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 uh, got a a long history, uh, huge territory, a big population, all these. All these uh, factors that that make China so important in the world. One out of every five people on the planet is Chinese, and so that uh, certainly suggests that uh, we need to pay attention and, and take seriously what's going on there. But China is a real place. The reason that I emphasize that, or the reason that I start with that, is that we look at China, we're not going to see something that's uh, some sort of schematic, some sort of, uh, uh, you know, let's flip the light switch and go from the history of imperialism and colonialism and China's own uh, troubled economic past, social injustice, all the things that plague that country. Uh, and we can't just, you know, the revolution of 1949 just doesn't flip over into a socialist paradise, a, a utopia of the working class immediately or indeed as as comrades uh, like Lenin and, and Mao Zedong have have repeatedly emphasized uh, it's a struggle it's a process that's going to take a long long time it's a change not only in economic relationships in the infrastructure of an economy but changes in the in the political culture of a society indeed in the in the psychology the lived experience the uh, what what Marx sometimes this calls the social metabolism of 1.4 billion people by this time so when we look at china we we shouldn't expect to have an answer that's just simple and straightforward can we say china socialist is china not socialist uh you know what is what is the nature of china china is, is many things 
Uh, I think that there are some essences which we need to bear in mind. Uh, and, and if I had to, uh, which for our purposes here, I'm going to come down, I would say, yes, I believe that China is, if not a fully developed socialist country, still a country in which the government and the Communist Party, the leading political force in the country, are pursuing uh, a quest for a socialist future, endeavoring to build a China which will be more just, more equitable, uh, in which the wealth produced by working people will be distributed in ways that conform to the ideals of, of socialism as they have been articulated and, and, uh, and pursued. Is that the reality that we see in China today? Certainly not entirely by any means. China is full of contradictions. Those contradictions have historical origins, most particularly in the present period in, in the decisions made some 40 years ago now to pursue policies of using market mechanisms to develop the economy. Decisions were made that uh, uh, you know, that although China had achieved great things in its first 30 years after liberation in terms of improving the lives of its people, in terms of laying the foundations for socialist development, China was still a poor country. There was a kind of egalitarianism of poverty, uh, but uh, many people, certainly people in leadership positions, felt that an acceleration of economic development would yield a situation down the road in which a sufficient level of material abundance would be attained to allow the actual implementation of socialist distribution. I think it's been my perception, or at least my understanding, my sense of things, that in that process there was an understanding that, that there would be things generated in the course of using market mechanisms which would be counterproductive, which would be adverse impact on on the environment, on the political uh, culture, even on the lives of many people. And it has been a process which has involved some pain. It has involved disruptions, dislocations. We've seen the growth of corruption, of inequality, of environmental stresses. But critical to this process, I think uh, what what makes the difference for China, certainly a difference when we contrast it with the experience of the Soviet Union, is the ability to preserve and maintain a leading role for the Communist Party, for the ideals of socialism, for a legal infrastructure and a political infrastructure which continues to instantiate socialist values and socialist ideals, whether or not and I think we have to concede that in many instances uh, uh, there are problems. Those are fully realized in, in, in practice. Uh, I think that, that what we, the way we need to think of China is as a work in progress, as a project, the project of socialist development, the project of socialist construction. So let me say a few things about why I think that this is still a project still a socialist endeavor, still a process of building a socialist future. And I think that there are a number of important indicators that can suggest to us how the, the, the ideals and in some ways the realities of socialist development continue to be very powerful in China and continue to play a significant role. One that uh, I think is very important, we can go back, uh, uh, what, 14 years or so now to the 2008 global economic crisis, when China took a, a pretty serious hit, not so much because of its own exposure to the kinds of financial shenanigans that caused so much trouble in the Western capitalist core, but because of its vulnerability to uh, a, a massive decline in export demand. Uh, which saw tens of millions of workers being laid off from their jobs. These were people who were not simply cast out upon the streets of, of great cities, but who could, uh, and for the most part did, return to villages where they continued to have household registrations, where they could be provided with minimal, basic, but nonetheless existing social services, and where they could 
to some degree, uh, uh, to a, a significant degree, ride out uh, the worst phases of this economic crisis. Um, lessons, of course, were learned from this. Uh, uh, to, to uh, reorient certain aspects of the economy away from such a heavy reliance on export, that certainly hasn't been done completely, but uh, that, that is a process that continues to be pursued. Uh, a greater emphasis on meeting domestic needs, a greater emphasis on investment within the country to try to uh, alleviate uh, uh, poverty, the most absolute poverty. Um, another uh, uh, big example, and I'll just touch on this for a moment, I'll come back to it in a minute because it's so much in the headlines right now, has been the question of, uh, of the response to COVID, right? Um, China still has only about 6,000 people that have died of COVID as compared to my country, the United States, where we've had about 1.1 million people in a population that's a quarter the size of that of China. So something is different. Right. And it seems to me that the difference has been or one way to think about the difference has been that, of course, in the United States, healthcare, like everything else, is a commodity. The pursuit of profit uh, is the primary determinant of political decision making. Uh, and uh, as a as a political society and as a society in general, the United States decided to, uh, you know, put economic uh, interests first and to let a million people die uh, because uh, you know, that, was, uh, that was more profitable. Profitable in a very immediate sense for healthcare corporations, for insurance companies, for the pharmaceutical industry, and also profitable in the sense of maintaining a so-called normal economy uh, in the face of uh, other options which would have involved more severe economic disruptions. In China, in contrast, uh, the priority, the emphasis has been on, on saving lives. Now, that, of course, has been portrayed in the West as uh, the, they're one of their favorite words in referring to China, draconian, uh, you know, the draconian policies towards, uh, you know, COVID lockdowns. And again, certainly, uh, you know, the, the, the question of lockdowns is one that, that has not been handled uh, perfectly by any means in all instances. And yet there's an undeniable number uh, which is, you know, a vast difference in, in the mortality between uh, China and, and the United States and, and indeed much of, of the Western world. And I simply think that that's a, that's a reflection of a prioritization of people, the health, public health as a, as a value, as a right uh, over, you know, uh, economic, uh, the economic pursuit of maximizing profitability. Um, you know, we're familiar, I'm sure, with with other stories, other narratives out of China, the, the, the campaigns to alleviate absolute poverty, hundreds of millions of people having their their economic uh, uh, livelihoods uh, enhanced uh, through through the actions of the state. We've heard tales of uh, uh, recently uh, in the last certainly the last few years of uh, efforts to constrain uh, uh, some of the behavior, certainly some of the worst behavior of of private capital. Uh, certainly there is private capital. There are capitalists, big capitalists in China, and, and we need to recognize that. Uh, but, uh, but the party and the government are still in a position to, to put constraints on that, to not allow private capital to become uh, the politically dominant force in China. Uh, and, I, and I think that while that remains a uh, struggle that remains a process that thus far at least I think we've seen indications that that is the direction in which uh, the leadership is at least attempting uh, to move. Addressing concerns in the environment. Again, you know, uh, this is not something that has been completely resolved, but China certainly has done a lot to uh, uh, address its environmental issues. It has become a leading force in the world uh, in terms of alternative alternative energy research, production, and consumption. Uh, everything from electric vehicles to solar panels to wind energy, hydroelectricity. Uh, this is not, a, again, it's not a complete uh, process, but it's one that is certainly uh, given a, a high priority in China. Um, 
on, on some other levels, uh, I think that for those of us with, with the question of is China socialist or is China moving in a socialist direction, some things like the revival of, uh, of the study of Marxism are important indicators that uh, this, is a, this is a critical uh, ideology, it's a critical guide to, to building a socialist future, and I think the fact that there's been some re-engagement with that, some revival of that, uh, is a very important uh, indicator. Um, as well. I think that there are serious concerns, serious problems that still remain for China. Um, you know, uh, I, there's there's a lot, the, even the socialist political rhetoric that we hear these days largely talks about the people rather than the working class. And I think that that's, uh, you know, something that I would certainly like to hear articulated in different ways. There, of course, is a tremendous gender gap uh, in terms of the leadership of, of uh, the party, especially the Central Committee, the Political Bureau. Uh, we just don't see enough women and sometimes any women in leading positions. So certainly there are uh, uh, issues like that that are very serious and need to be taken, uh, you know, taken into account. And of course, uh, in, in my opinion, one of the most critical problems facing not just China, but uh, societies in other countries as well, attempting to to build a new order, to build a, a new alternative, a socialist future, is the, the perennial problem of bureaucracy. Uh, bureaucracy is what spawns a lot of the corruption that we see. It spawns certain kinds of inefficiencies. And that is a struggle, again, that is an ongoing, a continuing issue for China. Let me say one last thing uh, about the COVID situation because of what's in the news right now uh you know we've seen uh reports of, of protests of uh people uh, uh, chanting uh, anti-government slogans and things like this and i think that there's there's a couple of of things to bear in mind about this one is certainly that i think anyone can understand that living with these policies living with the lockdowns living with the constraints that that has involved it's certainly going to be frustrating. Uh, it's certainly going to be something that, that it's tough. You know, there's no question about it. And the idea that people, you know, some people are going to reach a, a, a point of, of so much frustration that they're going to take that out, uh, that especially, especially right now, at a moment, and I think it's important to remember this, at a moment when they're beginning to take steps to lighten the constraints of COVID policy. The, after the 20th Party Congress, there have been a few indicators, a few new announcements of trying to trying to ease some of this. That's a point where, if anything, people can can sort of get a sense that maybe change, maybe change in that direction is coming. Maybe it's possible, and so that I think only enhances. Uh, or intensifies the frustration and enhances the sense of an opportunity of a moment when expressing yourself in the streets uh, maybe maybe a viable or a necessary uh, alternative. The bourgeois media, of course, loves to present any kind of demonstration, any kind of protest, any kind of uh, public gatherings in China as you know. Oh gosh, you know, we're going to have a color revolution. You know, they're going to overthrow the Communist Party. China's finally going to get to follow the path. Of, uh, of you know being totally subsumed within the global capitalist order, uh, I think that's a fundamental misreading. Uh, I think that that when we see people, when we see Chinese people, Chinese citizens exercising their their rights to to demonstrate, their rights to protest, their rights to uh, to call up for change, uh, for calling for change in policies in their government, what we see is a vibrant civil society. What we see is a society in which people at least at some points, get politically engaged. I think that that's another area in which uh, uh, I'd like to see uh, China have a slightly different uh, or maybe a significantly different profile. I'd like to see more mass engagement, more mass uh, uh, activity in terms of, of, uh, of politics. So I think that when we see demonstrations, when we see things like this, we shouldn't just immediately think that this spells the end of something or this spells, you know, the idea that people are are rebelling against the oppression of the Communist Party, but rather see it as the idea that people are, are willing to express themselves and believe that that expression can in some way at least have an effective political impact. And I think that, you know, the question isn't the headlines of, oh, there was a demonstration. The question is, how does that affect the, the, the development of policy and practice uh, in, in, in the period that, that follows along with that? So, 
that's that's enough from me for right now. Uh, I'll be happy to, of course, hear what questions and discussion goes on. And I think we're supposed to say a few words at the end as well. So let me close with that. Very much, Ken. Um, um, I'm to introduce um, comrade Andrew Murray to say a few words next. Um, in inviting Andrew to say a few words, can I draw your attention to um, his book, Is Socialism Possible um, in Britain? Funny enough, copies on the side there, <laughs> um, £10, um, special prize tonight, and Andrew will even sign them for you. So don't just take them, you'll have to buy them. <laughs> 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 it's worth a try. <laughs> uh, so, Andrew, over to you. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Roger, and thank you for the invitation to address uh, this meeting uh, this evening. Um, I've got a long association with Marx Library and uh, and the Morning Star. I'll talk a little bit about my association with Socialist China uh, in uh, a second, but it's a pleasure to be here. And let me start with a story uh, which will illustrate how I intend to approach the subject this evening. So it involves uh, a comrade, now a late comrade, called Kevin Halpin, who, for those who don't know him, was a skilled engineering worker, a rank and file uh, leader of uh, workers' struggles in Britain and a lifelong member of the Communist Party. Uh, he visited China on an official party delegation shortly after relations were restored between the Communist Party of China and the Communist Party of Britain and found himself driving across a rather arid plain in the interior of China. Uh, and he espied some mountains in the middle distance. And he said to the Chinese comrade acting as the uh, guide, it'd be a good idea if you built some uh, aqueducts to get the water down from the top of the mountains to irrigate the plains. And the Chinese comrade said nothing. A few hours later, they found themselves up the mountains and they're clearly visible were uh, uh, rather ancient uh, aqueducts and uh, Kevin Halpin asked oh, when did you build these and the answer was two and a half thousand years ago <laughs> and he told the story against himself really <laughs> against the assumptions of the skilled British working class going to China uh, to think everything had been basically invented in Lancashire in the, in the, 18, uh, in the 19th century so <laughs> Uh, so I approach it in this spirit today. I'm not an expert on China, unlike uh, Ken, I can't draw on a, a background of uh, erudition, uh, but I do uh, approach it as a communist. And I, the title of tonight's meeting is The Evolving Significance of the Chinese Revolution. And I was thinking about how it has evolved. When I became a communist, which was in the 1970s, I joined a, a communist party that was very much on the Moscow side of the uh, division in the international communist movement, uh, but I was quite critical, I suppose, of the Communist Party leadership at the time. And me and the comrades who I worked with in East London, young communists at the time, uh, we found ourselves very critical of the Communist Party of China because it regarded the Soviet Union then as capitalist, which we regarded as nonsensical. But at the same time, the issues that have given rise to the ideological split in the in the 1960s we found ourselves sympathetic to the Chinese position on the idea of peaceful revolution, a state of the whole people, uh, even the question of, uh, of Stalin, peaceful coexistence and so on. So even then there was a sort of ambiguity and a conflict in our views of China as it was. And we devoutly looked forward to the day when China and the Soviet Union maybe had been reconciled because that would have given a huge impetus to the possibilities of world socialism at the time. But that of course is a history uh, that uh, never happened. What we've seen since that time, what has happened, is China's rise in the world. And uh, the significance of that uh, can be uh, easily stated. It has ended, uh, or is ending, two centuries of hegemony by European and North American uh, powers. Uh, it is starting to reverse what's been called the great divergence between the economies of developed capitalist countries in the rest of the world that began signally with the Opium War uh, in the 1840s. And it challenges by its existence the imperialist powers monopoly of global violence. It doesn't mean there isn't some violence that isn't down to the imperialist powers, but their world policing role is compromised. 
And it is those reasons which give rise to the various anti-Chinese campaigns. I'm not saying at all that if one takes the situation in Xinjiang or Hong Kong or other issues that there is nothing to criticise. I think that would be uh, illusory. But those are not the reasons why China is being attacked. It is because uh, it threatens the unipolar uh, world uh, uh, order. Uh, the, it, its strength and power gives other countries choices that they might not otherwise have and it creates the possibilities of a more equal uh, world between uh, countries and uh, nations. Now, I don't need to add anything to what uh, Ken has said about the uh, importance of, of China's sort of internal uh, evolution. Of course, we always come back to the question, is China socialist or capitalist? I've only visited China once, that was for about 10 days, four years ago. And when I came back, everyone says, well, what do you think? Is it socialist or capitalist? Well, one answer is, well, how on earth can you tell from a 10-day visit? You're really no better off at the end of it than you are at the beginning from ass assessing uh, that. But the other question, I think, uh, arises, and this is my theme really this evening, is socialism and capitalism, they are universal concepts, yet they're universal concepts which emerged in 19th century industrial Europe. Uh, that's when they were developed. It cannot be expected that they remain the same once they become globalized, and in particular, once they encounter other civilizations, other uh, cultures. They can only get modified to some degree or other through that process. And I always say, if China is capitalist or socialist, it is not a capitalist country like any other we have seen nor is it a, if it's a socialist country does it correspond to the socialism that we saw in the 20th uh, century so i think part of the problem we have is we all think we know what capitalism is marx wrote a very powerful book about it uh, and we've had a lot of experience of it and we know the variations on the thing when we talk about socialism we are not so sure uh, of our footing marx wrote relatively little about socialism. Uh, what he did say was that it is the dictatorship of the proletariat, and perhaps this comes to a point about class nature of the state, which can uh, 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 touch them. But the socialism that existed in the 20th century was basically what was called socialism came in two main variations, Western social democracy, which has never really taken root outside quite small parts of the world, basically uh, developed capitalist countries, imperialist countries, or Soviet socialism, which in the end, uh, as we know, uh, collapsed. So one of the points it was suggested that we touch on is, I mean, what are the foundations of a socialist society? Well, I mean, it, it's not um, an easy question to answer. I think they include a working class uh, state, working class in power, limitations on commodity production, the elimination of exploiting classes, but not necessarily all class differences, uh, and the combating of social inequality. And the Chinese are very modest now in what they claim. They're talking about in the primary stage of socialism, a stage that might last for a century or more. Uh, and I wonder whether their modesty isn't more appropriate as a way of understanding what, in, in 1919 um, or 1918, leaders of the Comintern said, uh, we will have forgotten there was even a struggle for communism in a couple of years' time. It'll all be over, we'll have won. Well, I mean, now I think the idea that this transition is gonna be a very elongated process is uh, more uh, uh, accurate. Now, one thing that is discussed a lot in relation to China is the idea of the signification of Marxism. And I want to talk a bit about that. There are two ways to understand that. One is to say that Marxism is a given, basically in this accepted body of ideas and analysis, and it just needs to be applied correctly in each country with variations, and that, that Mao Zedong and Communist Party of China is very successful at that. The other is that Marxism itself gets transformed, not negated, but you know, a change through its engagement, its emergence from the labor movements of Western Europe uh, into all other parts of the world with different uh, economy, economic background, different civilizations, and different philosophical uh, traditions. Now, I've read the ideological history of the Communist Party of China, an official volume, it runs to over uh, one and a half thousand pages, and in there you will find it, they say, the history of the Communist Party of China was formerly the history of the localization of Marxism. That's to say the first understanding in China, but from now on it will be the history of Chinese Marxism. Now what is Chinese Marxism? What do we mean by that? 
the rules of the Communist Party of China, and I try and, as far as possible in analysing China, draw on Chinese sources themselves. They have to be in English, I can't read Mandarin. But the Communist they, they, they say the six ideological bases, they all sort of stack up on one top of, of the other. Uh, Marxism-Leninism, Mao Zedong thought, Deng Xiaoping theory, the th theory of three represents, theory of scientific development, and Xi Jinping thought on socialism with Chinese characteristics. Now, I don't need to say much about Marxism-Leninism. That is the only one of those six ideological building blocks that is not made in China uh, and has had a universal uh, application uh, in uh, principle. Mao Zedong thought was obviously Chinese uh, in origin, but it also, for a time, not anymore, I think, was claimed to have a sort of a wider, more general application. Uh, the subsequent uh, theories, uh, every, <laughs> every party leader has got his own one written in the Constitution, uh, do, uh, are made in and for uh, uh, China. So I'd like to just look a little bit at, uh, at those. Marxism-Leninism obviously framed the Chinese Revolution and it contextualized a national revolution uh, against imperialism and modernization within a global socialist revolution. It meant that the Communist Party of China could retain a working class and socialist orientation as it fought for national liberation and new democracy, while actually being for many years isolated from the Chinese uh, working class because it's part of a global uh, socialist movement. One can now say, perhaps, and I said this when discussing the centenary of the October Revolution, that the greatest legacy of the October Revolution may be the Chinese Revolution, uh, that it created the circumstances for that to happen. And of course, the Chinese Revolution, certainly in some shape or form, survives to this day, whereas the Soviet Union, of course, uh, doesn't. Mao Zedong thought, too, very relevant in placing the peasantry, the great majority of the world's population, uh, at the centre of revolutionary practice, something that had previously been neglected uh, by Marxism. And the idea of the countryside surrounding the cities is not so irrelevant now. If you look at what happened in Afghanistan last year, I mean, the Taliban had no socialist objectives, but the idea of, uh, of a peasant-based movement surrounding the cities, anyway, it's still, uh, uh, it's still there. Uh, I think the problem is, or a problem is, that this the contradictions within these ideological positions, uh, ideological heritage, aren't always uh, uh, accepted. Uh, the transition from Mao Zedong thought to Deng Xiaoping theory is a shift from prioritizing social relations uh, and the struggle transition, uh, transforming social relations to transforming the forces uh, of production and the growth of the national income. It, both those can be justified in Marxist terms. But the latter can also, of course, be justified in capitalist terms, uh, while the former uh, uh, cannot. Now, a question is asked at this stage, could the USSR have reformed that way? Uh, would we still have a socialist community had those ideas been uh, taken up more accurately? I, it's an interesting counterfactual. I'm not sure there's any definitive answer uh, possible. One problem is that reform and opening up in China came against the background of prolonged turmoil, whereas the Gorbachev reforms came against the background of prolonged stagnation. Uh, so there's quite a different dynamic uh, at work. It's also an interesting counterfactual to say, had the Soviet Union survived, had the socialist community survived, would China's reform and opening up have taken the same path? I don't think anyone thinks it's a coincidence that the Soviet Union fell in 1991, and the next year, the very next year, Deng Xiaoping went to Shenzhen to launch the radical extension of the uh, uh, market uh, uh, relationships uh, that he was championing. The three represents theory, which is associated with Zhang Zemin, uh, I think that was the maybe the high point of what I would regard as bourgeois ideology in the Communist Party of China. It prioritized the advanced productive forces uh, only and seemed to be an adaptation to capitalist uh, globalization. But this now seems to be being reversed somewhat in practice, but still not necessarily in theory. Uh, and that is why I think there are contradictions in Chinese society, in Chinese socialism, which are normal and natural, uh, come from the real world, but aren't always acknowledged, uh, which perhaps makes it harder to, uh, to deal with them. Now, China has its own traditions and cultures, which brings a vast amount to the world revolutionary struggle. Um, Marxism arose on the basis, or one of its, its bases, one of its famous three component parts was uh, German philosophy, a philosoph philosophical tradition of Kant and Hegel. 
Uh, whereas China, more is heir to a Confucian uh, philosophy. I'm no expert on Confucius uh, at all, uh, but uh, Xi Jinping said recently Confucius has had a great influence on the thinking of the civilized progress of humanity and the signification of Marxism, which to think of Confucius's thought in terms of historical materialism. He also said that Mao Zedong used the ideas of Confucius, which I'm not really sure is true. Um, other people may know better than me. Uh, Mao said he was part Marx and part uh, Qin Shi Hung, the first emperor of China who uh, banned Confucian books and buried Confucian scholars alive. Um, and Mao's final campaign was to criticize Lin Piao and Confucius which is an odd, uh, an odd coupling, uh, but it does suggest that it doesn't reflect well on Confucius, let's say, um, given that Lin Piao had just died trying to flee China after allegedly trying to kill Mao Zedong. But many Chinese writers now look to affect a synthesis here, a Confucian socialist republic, Hu Jintao, um, who was the leader after Zhang Zemin, uh, announced that tried to mobilize Chinese society around eight honors and eight disgraces, a Confucian view of how uh, uh, people should conduct uh, themselves. Now, the point I'm trying to bring in here is that two of the ideas that are championed most by the Chinese Communist Party are common prosperity and harmonious society. Mm -hmm. Those are not sort of Marxist ideas in the original sense. They leave out class struggle, uh, uh, but if you ask ordinary people, would they correspond to an idea of socialism? I think they'd say yes, common prosperity, we don't have that in Britain at the moment, a harmonious society, we don't have that either. If you had these things, would that be some sort of an idea of socialism? I don't, I'm not suggesting for a second, that replaces other understandings of socialism, but does it, does it enrich it? Does it modify it? Does it bring something new uh, to uh, the party? Can we learn from it without aping it? These are only questions I want to uh, uh, place. Now, um, I, th I think uh, Ken has said, made a, a, you know, a good argument about how the uh, socialist uh, element in China has been getting uh, stronger. Uh, Xi Jinping has, uh, uh, it seems to me, to have leaned to the left during his leadership. He's strengthened the state, he's tackled corruption, and he has reasserted Marxism ideologically. And he has reoriented the Chinese Communist Party to remember the ultimate goal, which is communism, uh, uh, even if it's a, a, a distant uh, goal. Uh, the state is playing a stronger regulating role in the economy. And one thing that's noticeable, which you have to say to people who think China is capitalist, it's now more than 40 years of reform and opening up, and there has been no crisis of overproduction. Now, really, if you're a capitalist society, you'd, you'd have had one uh, uh, by now. Uh, we get them far more often than every, uh, every uh, 40 years. Of course, that doesn't answer the whole uh, problem, the how do state firms act? I mean, we know from Britain in the 1970s, when nationalised, you could easily work for nationalised industry, both your parents go work for different nationalised industries, you could live in a council house, the state was sort of quite, uh, not omnipresent, but it was a big thing, I mean, you, know, you, only, you, know, you could spend all your life engaged with the state, but it wasn't a socialist state. Uh, and we can see today, you know, state firms in China uh, often act independently and driven to some extent by the profit uh, uh, motive, but they are contained. And I think there's three separate questions here. Is the capitalism in China? Undoubtedly, yes. And there are capitalists, as Ken said. Is there a capitalist class? Which is a different thing. A capitalist class requires a degree of organization, uh, articulation. If it's to be a, a class uh, for itself in a Hegelian sense, that's questionable. Is it the ruling class? I would say not. But for us in Britain, all those three questions are the same. They, they, you can't disentangle them. You would try and disentangle them. That's what we're used to, but it's not what happens uh, um, uh, everywhere uh, uh, necessarily. But then what is the state in China? Now here I'm going to read another bit from the Chinese Communist Party's rules, where it says, China is a socialist country of people's democratic dictatorship under the leadership of the working class based on an alliance of workers and farmers. It is a country where all power of the state belongs to the people. Now, that's really a bit of a, a jumble of ideas. There's four different states in there. There's the idea of people's democracy, which includes uh, always the petty bourgeois class, small capitalists, and in some readings, the national bourgeoisie, you know, those capitalists who aren't um, linked up with imperialism. The leadership of the working class alone, that implies the dictatorship of the proletariat, a classic Marxist concept. 
An alliance of workers and farmers points you towards a revolutionary democratic dictatorship of workers and peasants, which is an idea Lenin introduced in 1905 and 06. And the final one is the state of the whole people, which was an idea associated with Khrushchev and the CPSU, which they sometimes well, tiptoed away from. Now, my point is this is, is not to simply say that this is a bit of obfuscation, that they're not answering the question clearly, although it seems that they're not. It shows that there is a, a real, there are conflicts and struggles in China. Uh, the, the, the process of reform and uh, opening up has probably, uh, has has masked the struggles that were quite avert in the Mao Zedong period, but they're still there. They will get channeled through the Communist Party of China because it is the sole governing party. And that's what happens if you have one governing party. I remember in the 1980s, uh, a, a leader of the Polish Communist Party describing herself as a Reagan Republican sounded completely absurd. In no way it was. It was certainly completely undesirable. But you know, if you only have one party, of course, all sorts of contradictions, not only within your own society, but reflecting developments at a global level, get reflected uh, in there. And I think there's an uncertainty, perhaps, in how these are to be given uh, 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 expression uh, in China. Uh, but this is the result, in my view, in large part of the implantation uh, of Marxism, its introduction in a, a, a different uh, culture and civilization. And it's not a model for the rest of the world, but it is a new perspective on uh, socialism. I said earlier that the Chinese Revolution was framed by the World Socialist Revolution that began in the Soviet Union and unfortunately didn't move much further for a long time. Uh, but today it, it's emerged in the framework of globalization, capitalist globalization, which is build, trying to build a new society in that setting, trying to turn it to its advantage uh, in many ways, uh, and to try and find a new path forward in that situation. But that world of capitalism, that, that is now shaking. It's been shaking since 2008. It's that, that context is changing. China is going to find itself in a still more different uh, situation where because the Chinese the Communist Party of China has maintained itself uh, uh, in power, has uh, you know, kept itself uh, in charge uh, of the situation, it will find new possibilities to develop uh, its idea in a multipolar uh, uh, world. And Xi Jinping again said recently that one of the achievements of the Communist Party of China was to prevent socialism from basically disappearing as a, 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 a power uh, across the world after uh, 1991 and the end of the Soviet Union. And that is that is true. And the fact that they set this as an objective, of course, governments can sometimes obscure what they're doing or lie about it. But the idea that setting the socialist objective and that permeating through Chinese society, that this is all a fabrication, of course, is not something I think that we could uh, accept. So I think uh, China's uh, role, its significance is only going to uh, grow. And I apologize if I've given a, a sort of equivocated on some uh, questions, um, but uh, uh, it, it is hard uh, to sort of try and give definitive uh, answers to such a huge uh, uh, question. And I'll defend myself by quoting the chairman, not, not our distinguished chairman this evening, <laughs> uh, uh, but Mao Zedong, who said, man's knowledge at any given stage of development is only relative truth. The sum total of innumerable relative truths constitutes absolute truth. So that's my relative truth. Thank you. Hey, comrades, thank, thank you both. Uh, we now have um, some time for some questions and some brief questions, if, if we can. Please, comrades, and um, the briefer your contributions, the more people we can get in into the into the discussion. So, can you um, do you want to ask a question or make a contribution? Can you introduce yourself, um, and um, and we'll take your points. Anybody in here? We're going to have to fight with wires. And well. <laughs> Okay, well, I hope I don't strangle anybody. Um, <laughs> yeah, the question I've got is more contemporary. Uh, so, uh, my name is Tony Norfield. Um, my, my question is more contemporary and also looking for the next few years. And what it boils down to is the relationship between Russia and China. Because essentially, I think what we've got is probably in my lifetime, and I'm no spring chicken, um, the 
most serious challenge to the hegemony of the Western powers. And this can only work, I think, if we have a decent, at least um, uniform view uh, of what to do next on the part of both Russia and China. And in the past, of course, uh, you don't need a big history lesson from me, but there's been plenty of disputes and all kinds of aggravations and double dealing and all the rest of it between the two countries. It seems now as if the desperation on the part of the US, NATO, et cetera, and Western Europe is such that they're all lining up to make Russia and or China the big enemy. So that probably is enough to keep those two countries on the same track. And I, do, I wanted on your assessment of that because I think the next few years are going to be critical for that. We're seeing all kinds of issues of, um, you know, the expansion of the BRICS countries, Shanghai Cooperation Organization in with et cetera, et cetera. There's all kinds of different deals being done and undermining the institutions and structures of the current domination by the Western powers. So, you know, to, to look more in a contemporary form and, and ahead, I, I'd, I'd be interested in your assessment of those, those issues. Thank you, Comrade. Thank you. Just muted the whole system. Now back again. Thanks. <laughs> Someone's going to get hurt. There is it, really. <laughs> Can you? Um, Francisco Dominguez, uh, originally from Chile, nobody's perfect. <laughs> um, I want to the speakers to address the following issue, which you know matters to us in Latin America. Um, the evolving significance of the Chinese revolution for a place such as that one, especially given that we are in the vanguard of the struggle for socialism and we're moving forward very nicely. And the specific question I want to ask is this. I've done some papers on the Cuban revolution and Cuban economy. And at the beginning there was black markets, then there were parallel markets, there were great markets, there were tolerated markets and, you know, 40 years later, 50 years later, there are still some markets there. So that's number one. In other words, it doesn't seem to be a good idea to suppress the market because it comes back. You shut the door to it, come through the window anyway. So that's number one. And number two, this is why I want to, you know, to discuss the evolving significance of the Chinese revolution in this connection. In Nicaragua, there is a social revolution going on, and there is almost no proletariat. I remember I asked the Nicaraguan ambassador, one of the Nicaraguan ambassadors in Spain, how were they able to actually organize the petty bourgeoisie to <laughs> around the FSLN to actually push forward for a social revolution without the proletariat? And these petty bourgeoisie are all small entrepreneurs who actually are very fond of the market and they depend very heavily on that. Thank you. So before I take anybody else in the room, I'm going to take just so we can include um, people who are online as well. Um, I'm going to take. Um, all right. I don't know whether we can have the microphone. Um, we've had two questions in the chat. First, um, from Mark Blacklock for Ken. Um, Mark says, I know you served for a time at the NMSU Confucius Institute, now closed, I believe, under political pressure. How do you view Prime Minister Sunak's declared intention to close all CIs in the UK? I believe there are 15, under what seems to be the spurious claim that these cultural centres represent a security threat. The second contribution we've got online is from Richard Clark, who asks, can the speakers say a little about the abolition in 2018 
of term limits for the presidency, does this increase or reduce the risks of something going wrong? To do actually, rather than just wait till the end to take everything, I think I'm going to take com um, some comments now and then come back and take some more points. Um, Ken, do you want to pick up on any of those? Sure. <laughs> um, I mean, uh, Russia China question, I think that's really, really critical. Uh, I think that it needs to be understood in a very uh, sorry, camera. Uh, uh, needs to be understood in a very particular uh, and clear, clear way. Um, uh, you know, <laughs> regardless of of how uh, we may uh, ultimately, in our own thinking, resolve this question of uh, the significance of the Chinese Revolution, to what degree is is China socialist, capitalist, hybrid, whatever. Uh, clearly, it's a different. Uh, economy, it's a different political culture, a different society than <clears throat> Russia. Russia, uh, I don't think anybody is holding up the question of whether Russia is a socialist state now. Um, so the, the relationship between China and Russia is not one of, you know, fraternal solidarity between socialist countries, uh, but is largely, I think, shaped, as, as was suggested, by uh, the fact that, uh, that they find themselves uh, as the targets of uh, of a of an increasingly uh, desperate and and somewhat flailing American imperialism, uh, as as the United States sees its its hegemonic place in global capital uh, uh, eroding, uh, so I think that uh, yeah the question of of that that future relationship and and maintaining alliance if you will uh, a friendship even between those countries uh, they have very different systems very different. Uh, uh, his, you know, histories and cultures in many ways, but they have uh, some interests in common, and and the most important of those uh, are our opposition to and resistance to American imperialism. So I would like to you know see that as something that that continues to be operative going forward. I, I'm not really in a position to say much about uh, about Nicaragua. It's not an area that I have a lot of expertise in, or indeed really any, um, but. Uh, I guess one thought just in relation to China is, of course, that the absence of an industrial proletariat or a minimal role for an industrial proletariat clearly doesn't preclude uh, revolution. Chairman Mao, of course, uh, sought to understand uh, the peasantry in China uh, largely as what he called agricultural proletarians. This has a lot to do with the history of commercial agriculture in China. China has a long history of uh, what uh, some people, uh, including myself, see as, as essentially capitalist uh, commodity production in the agricultural sector. Uh, many, many <clears throat> uh, peasants in China were, were day workers, wage workers, people who were not uh, small proprietors in their own right. So their status as, as petty bourgeois, I think, is uh, perhaps uh, different than in some other contexts. But it may be that, that the situation, particularly in Nicaragua, is something more more shaped by that. But as I say, I'm not really in a, in a position to comment um, with any kind of profundity about that. The Confucius Institute question, I think, is, yeah, uh, I'm, you know, I was, uh, I was uh, uh, pleased. Um, the other day, I happened to be at, uh, at SOAS and, uh, and saw that uh, in their main building, uh, the Confucius Institute still is on the, on the signboard up on, the, I guess it's like the seventh floor or something like that. Because um, in America, there has been a, a very extensive and, and successful on the part of the government campaign uh, against Confucius Institutes. We had one at my university founded back in 2007. It functioned for uh, about uh, 13 years. Uh, we did a lot of programming. We brought teachers from China. We uh, had thousands of young people in southern New Mexico, a relatively poor part of our country had the opportunity to learn Chinese, learn about China. Uh, we never had any political interference in our programming from uh, the, the Chinese authorities, either from Hanban, the headquarters in Beijing, or from uh, the, the educational uh, uh, authorities at the consulate in Los Angeles, under whose, uh, you know, that's where New Mexico falls in the, in the allocation of, of territories uh, for, for the consular service. 
Um, so, uh, you know, our, our view of the Confucius Institute was that it was a great asset and resource for the community um, for reasons that, that are too depressing and complicated to go into. We had a change in administration at the university in 2019 that resulted in, in a new neoliberal administration of people brought in from the business community uh, uh, that reflected changes in our, in our local politics for a little bit. And they turned against that and, and shut it down on the, on the argument that uh, NMSU gets lots of money, certainly true, uh, tens of millions of dollars from the Department of Defense for military research, and uh, and they felt that they could either continue to take that money or take the money from China, which basically was a budget of about $100,000 a year. Uh, and obviously, uh, it's only economically rational that they would stay with uh, the Defense Department. So that seemed to me to be a pretty transparent uh, effort to to justify politically trying to silence uh, and deprive American people of any any kind of relationship with China. Uh, one of the things that makes it possible for so many distortions of, of reality about China to, to be effective in the West is the relatively minimal level of knowledge and experience that most people have, certainly in the United States. The number of people who read or speak Chinese, the number of people who've spent any kind of serious time in China is, is tiny. Uh, and that means that most people don't have any basis for judgment independent from what they're told by the bourgeois media. Um, term limits, uh, you know, uh, we often see uh, uh, the the idea that Xi Jinping uh, was elected for a third time. Uh, uh, again, the bourgeois media likes to refer to this as, uh, as unprecedented, as uh, you know, overturning established practice and things like this. And it should be borne in mind that that established practice was a matter of two political transitions. Uh, you know, so I think that uh, it's it's interesting, of course, that that this was done through a constitutional process. I think that needs to be recognized as well. You know, uh, does Xi Jinping plan to stick around for forever? I, I kind of doubt that. I, I certainly would not anticipate that don't even hope that I think that uh, there may be, uh, you know, there may be a feeling that in the in the position of, of both international strife and domestic challenge facing the country right now that continuity in leadership was important. Obviously, I'm not a party to those decisions and, and that's then those debates and discussions within the party aren't something to which I've ever been privy, but uh, I don't think that it's it's the kind of um, you know, profound betrayal of some sort of uh, 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 long established set of practices. I think that um, we'll see where it goes from here. Uh, I don't think that, uh, uh, you know, I just don't know what the what the future outcome of that will be, but I don't think it's something necessarily that that needs to be, you know, a, a toxin of doom. Uh, uh, I think that it's, uh, you know, uh, one may one may question it, one may say, well, you know, why didn't they stick with the, the two term limit? Uh, certainly, uh, uh, you know, there are political systems in the world where, where one might say the same thing. Although I think for Americans who elected Franklin Roosevelt four times uh, for 16 years, it's a little disingenuous to get their tights in a twist about this. I very much agree with what Kendra said on most of those points. I can't understand all this fuss about the term limits. Uh, I, as I understand it, term, the term limits were never introduced for the post of General Secretary of the Communist Party. They were for President of the Republic. And the former post is always the more significant. And uh, so, um, you know, both Mao Zedong and Deng Xiaoping, Deng, the latter with various designations, but they remained uh, the effective leaders of the party for much, uh, uh, much longer. And there's many different systems around the world. I don't, I don't see. I mean, do I think things will go wrong? If they go wrong, it won't be because of this. Uh, 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 I don't think. Um, on Francisco's uh, points, uh, uh, well, yeah, I mean, the the fact of revolutions without a proletariat or with a very small proletariat uh, have been a fact of history for the last, uh, um, well, since the end of the Second World War, uh, certainly. Uh, and that is one of the things which perhaps the Chinese Communist Party theorized more or first uh, of anyone, uh, 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 anyone else was not a very big proletarian in China in 1949, and it had been relatively isolated from the Communist Party since 1927. Uh, so this isn't really a fully new idea. How it 
integrates into a, a general theory of world revolution, of course, is another uh, a bigger uh, bigger issue. Um, but I think those, uh, the, you know, the, the revolutionary role of the peasantry or agricultural <laughs> labourers um, uh, alongside uh, the working class. Well, let's remember the European working class hasn't really had any revolutions for the last uh, uh, 70 plus years. Uh, th this is something we need to understand. And on the point about suppressing markets, I think I agree with what Francisco was uh, implying that actually trying to suppress markets is very, very difficult, particularly um, in situations where you don't have abundance uh, and you can't uh, even conceivably, even without the political prerequisites, move to the sort of distribution of goods uh, entirely without market relationships. Again, there's a lot of work that I found very interesting, Origi's book, uh, Adam Smith in Beijing, that tries to come to a theory of how a market economy doesn't have to lead to capitalism. Uh, again, I mean, these are all, this is what I think the Chinese call crossing the river a stone at a time, uh, as to how one finds a way through this. But I think the central point is that trying to move to the elimination of the market completely. Ever since Lenin tried it and reversed it, I think that, that there's been a lesson there. And on the point that Tony Northfield raised, I agree again with what Ken uh, said. Um, I think the, if you wanted to have a unipolar world, as the American imperialists have tried to do since 1991 and to some extent earlier, everyone who's excluded from that or marginalized by that tends to get driven together, even though the social systems are different. I mean, you know, Russia is no sort of socialism at all. It's clearly a capitalist country. Um, and so the alliance with uh, China, uh, as, as you know, what, you know, countries who are uh, sitting outside to some extent the unipolar power system, uh, this is a natural, uh, a natural thing. But I think there is a further difference in that China's rise does pose a sort of systemic challenge to the United States. I don't want to say threat because that's buying into the Cold War language around this challenge. Russia's, I don't think, does. Uh, I don't think it does. I don't think Russia has the uh, capacities that China has developed uh, and the international influence that China has uh, secured uh, through its economic policies. Uh, but I'd imagine for now that that relationship will remain uh, relatively strong. And as far as one can see, it has withstood the, uh, the shock of the uh, war around Ukraine too. Comrade here. Uh, it'd be really good if I wasn't just calling blokes as well. <laughs>
there is no capitalist party. The capitalists have to work under the guidance of the Communist Party of China. Now, to me, there are two other points far more important than all this. For one of them is Professor Steglet, who was a consultant to uh, Clinton, has a, a video in which he says the Chinese Communist Party has managed to improve the standard of living of one billion Chinese 20 folds. In other words, anybody who was getting 10 pounds per week is now getting 200 pounds per week. And that is an achievement. Whether, whether you, you call that ca capitalist or communist, the fact is 1 billion people's standard of living has improved 20 times. And another thing which is important to me, I have always been, uh, for more than half a century, against uh, imperialism, against American imperialism. And for the first time, I'm witnessing that as opposed to American uh, camp or poll, there is now a new poll with China and Russia fighting against imperialism. And to me, that is a very important thing because that gives me hope that one day oppressed people, with the help of, the Ch of China and Russia, can succeed in liberating themselves from imperialism. Thank you. Um, Ali al uh, uh, referring to the same stickless lecture, I think Kamal was to uh, talking about where we spoke to some people in Europe about uh, two years ago. He, uh, uh, he talked about how the Chinese have been very scientific and experimentalist. So when he was talking about actually about the village and town enterprises experiment, he says something that he noticed uh, is that the, uh, they adopted uh, quite an advanced scientific methods in terms of experimentation, trying things. If it doesn't work, they go something else. But of course, something th uh, that comes out of it, there were there in China, and I think that's still there, and that explains how uh, how fast they have developed further in the last fifty years. Is that there is this, this dynamism, dynamism of scientific thinking, and probably it goes back to Mao Zedong times when he said less. 100 uh, flowers bloom and so on, where there is a tendency, a culture within the Chinese Communist Party to experiment, to be scientific about uh, 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 what happens and, and move forward. And, and this is something that uh, is, of course, a source of optimism if this uh, continues forward, where there is an openness to experiment to do things. And the thing which we I don't know, and maybe uh, uh, Ken knows, uh, because he stayed in Spain in China sometime, is uh, to what extent do we have local democracy? And, uh, you know, to what extent there is dynamism within the Communist Party itself and the way it interacts with people and the way it tries things. Certainly the, the town and bridge enterprises, uh, I see it as very uh, interesting because it, 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 it allows entrepreneurship and local democracy in, in, in a very interesting way. And you see all kinds of enterprises. You see capitalist enterprises in China, of course, but you could see things like uh, what we call it, Huawei or Huawei, where I think it's a social enterprise. So there is uh, something very interesting happening in China and the experiment. And I remember uh, uh, one old, uh, uh, one uh, past uh, uh, colleague of ours, an Iraqi, famous Iraqi communist, who in 1980, he said, Look, you can't just take over power and say this is a dictator of the proletariat uh, uh, because the state itself, even if it is red, is oppressive by its nature. So what you have to do, you have to allow for competition. You have to show that uh, uh, you know a, a socialist enterprise does better than a, a capitalist enterprise. We should allow it to a certain extent in terms of uh, workers' uh, uh, salaries, in terms of their benefits, in terms of democracy, in terms of their well-being and see and you prove by experience that the social enterprise is progressing so the question is in china if you compare state enterprises and private enterprises how does the workers behavior uh, change between one and the other right. yeah. and the
highly sure this is the feature you might have to don't pull it out of the machine but we should be able to get there thank you Well, how about now? Is it on now? Yeah, okay. Uh, perhaps comrades in Europe are quite used to the fact that we have a quite significant power of a trade union. Um, you used to having a trade union around having that collective bargaining power against the employer or the states. Um, but the thing is, um, there has been an absence of a trade union in China, well, at least for my generation and my father's generation. Um, when they when they were around uh, in my grandfather's generation, I think mostly are state owned, and it are within the company they work for. Well, majority of the company that at the time was state owned. So I suppose the question for the speaker is: What do you make of the absence of a trade union power? And um, if if we do have independent trade union power, would you think that would push us further to socialism? and at the front, um, Carlos. Still no women want to ask any. Oh, I tried, I did try. Sorry. So we'll have to make do with you. Chinese Politburo. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Um, well, thank you so much to the speakers for what, what I thought were really uh, interesting and insightful presentations. Um, uh, so my name is Carlos Martinez. I'm a co-editor of Friends of Socialist China, which I suppose probably slightly gives the game away in terms of whether I think China's socialist or not. Um, and, you know, we had like really nuanced and complex and interesting analysis of that from, from our speakers, from Ken and from Andrew. And I'm sort of going to throw nuance and complexity out of the window completely um, and, and bring things down to, uh, you know, perhaps slightly hackneyed expression that the proof of the pudding is in the eating. Um, and I put it to you that there's no capitalist society, there's no society in which the capitalist class is the ruling class that could have achieved what China has achieved in terms of moving from being one of the poorest and most backward countries in the world um, to being you know, an advanced country, uh, to move from being, from being low on the human development index to being high on the human development index from you know suffering routine famines and starvation to being able to provide every single member of the population with an adequate nutritious diet with modern energy with clean water with health care with a minimum of 11 years education and so on and you know since we've had joseph stiglitz quoted twice in this meeting so far it seems appropriate that i at least once quote fidel castro <laughs> who um, in Beijing in 1993, when he was presenting Jiang Zemin with the order of Jose Marti, said, only socialism could have been capable of the miracle of feeding, clothing, providing with jobs, education, and healthcare, raising life expectancy to 70, now 78, by the way, overtaken the United States, and providing decorous shelter for more than a billion human beings in a minute portion of the planet's arable land, Thanks to such a feat at this difficult time for the world's peoples, over one fifth of humanity remains under the banner of socialism. I think it was a very powerful point back then in 1993, and it remains a very powerful point now. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm going to um, come back um, for the, these are going to be the kind of final comments, I think, now. Um, we've got a question from Judith. Um, what is the significance of the Belt and Road Initiative? Okay. <laughs> 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 that, Excellent. Can I um, ju just say before I, um, I call on Ken and, and Andrew just to say um, a few final words? Um, I mean, I, I have to say that I, I find it thoroughly impressive any country that can bring so many people out of poverty thoroughly impressive. I mean, I spend a lot of time actually writing about some of the poverty around the world right now, and the amount of famine there is, and the amount of disease there is, the amount of time that people are just struggling to put bread on the table. Um, last week, I visited Sri Lanka and just saw how garment workers there were struggling to survive. Um, I mean, just with nothing, basically. So any country that prioritizes taking so many people out poverty you've got to be pretty impressed by that really i think really impressed so 
I'm going to hand over to Ken first and then Andrew, um, and then we'll say a few ways to wind up. Um, question. Uh, let me, uh, we don't have a lot of time, so let me be very brief in, in, in response. And then, you know, maybe if people want to talk more informally afterwards. Um, the question of, uh, of sort of the scientific, uh, experimental, innovative uh, 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 nature of things. In some ways, that loops back to uh, Andrew's opening uh, story about the, uh, the, the irrigation, the, 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 the hydraulic systems out in, uh, out in Xinjiang. Um, you know, the idea, it's not just that, that uh, uh, scientific or innovative thought is something that, that, uh, that came along uh, with the revolution, although certainly having a, a Marxist orientation, having historical materialism, not having a political culture which was grounded in various kinds of mysticism or, or you know, ethical priorities or things like that. Uh, uh, you know, that certainly has, has reinforced this. But China, of course, has its own very, very rich tradition of, of science and technological innovation and all this, often either unrecognized or, or you know, actively rejected in the West, you know, this idea of, of the sort of changeless China, the ancient isolation, all this kind of stuff that, that still plagues too much, uh, not only popular, but sometimes even educated awareness. I think that yes, China is a very innovative and a very uh, scientific uh, culture, and and uh, certainly in terms of education now, there's tremendous investment in that aspect of things. Uh, that's in my personal view, that's that's not really something new, but certainly is, is something that is that is going to be beneficial uh, going forward. Well, these questions, I think, are, are, are pretty much related, which the, the question of, of, of sort of grassroots political level uh, participation and, and, and engagement and things like that, and the question uh, about, about trade unions, because those are both really about uh, the, the engagement to participation of people, uh, not you know, what we see in the media at the higher level, the meeting of the Central Committee or the, you know, the State Council or whatever it might be, National People's Congress. Um, certainly there are structures of participation in the sense that like delegates to the National People's Congress are, are elected in various localities and there's a hierarchy that builds up that, that leads to the representation that assembles at the National People's Congress. Um, should be remembered, of course, that the Communist Party of China uh, it has about 100 million members, more than one out of every 10 adults in China uh, is a member of the party. So that certainly suggests a level of, of, uh, of engagement and participation. But at the same time, there's a, there's a, a very astute uh, analyst of, of Chinese uh, political society named Wang Hui who wrote a book a few years ago called Depoliticized Politics, uh, in which he talks about how after the turmoil of, of the first 30 years, uh, when the reform programs first uh, are being brought in, after the death of Mao Zedong, the, the emergence of Deng Xiaoping, all of this, there's a kind of retreat um, from, from sort of mass activism, if you will. And that as the economy developed and as prosperity began to, to be more widespread, many people, uh, for whatever reasons, uh, subjective and objective, disengaged from, from a lot of direct political activity. People wanted to make money, people wanted to pursue their livelihoods, people to wanted, wanted to develop a comfortable existence. And I don't think anybody can fault people for wanting to have a, a quieter and better and, and, and more prosperous and happier life. Uh, but that has meant that there has been a, a, a different of political engagement. Um, and and I, again, I think that when we see these demonstrations in the street and things like that, I, I see that as, as evidence of or indications of a dynamic civic society. But, you know, that's not necessarily the, the, the nuts and bolts, the, the, the organizational work that needs to go on in terms of, of ensuring the, the responsiveness of, of, of state structures and, and the government and, and the party to the needs and interests of ordinary people. And I think that that's an area where, you know, again, it's a work in progress. There's a lot of room for, for further engagement and further improvement. Having said that, it's also the case that China 
is a socialist country, a socialist system, a socialist legal system in many ways. And so the idea of the trade union in particular as something which has an antagonistic relationship to the state or to, you know, let's say the ownership of, of uh, state enterprises, things like that, publicly or collectively owned enterprises, can be problematic. And, and that's something that I don't think I, uh, has been theorized quite in, 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 in with as much clarity as might be might be useful for us going forward. Um, yeah, uh, I don't think uh, that that if we look at performance uh, between state and private enterprises in China, I'm not sure that, that that's a, a we're going to see a lot of fundamental difference. Although when you're talking about the, the, the town and village enterprises, that's a different thing because those are much more low level, much more often collectively more community owned enterprises. That was a major phenomenon back in the first half of the 1980s and, and in that first phase of reform, less significant certainly since the influx of foreign capital and the and the, the and expansion of state-owned enterprises since then. Uh, so that's 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 a that's a very complex set of issues that, that I'm not going to try to unpack right now. Belt and Road Initiative. What can we say? I mean, it's it's. China's effort not to, as as we used to hear in the old days, and certainly, you know, I mean, I was a student radical in the 60s. This was great stuff at the time, not exporting revolution, but perhaps having China's development, China's path, China's successes in, in reducing poverty and in improving the lives of its people and prioritizing public health, all of these things serve as an example or an inspiration for other people. I think China's efforts to build networks of global investment and development that are out from under the dominance of American imperialism and the institutions that that it animates, like the IMF and the World Bank and all that, uh, I think that that's, that's a good thing. Uh, and so to the extent to which the BRI is an important factor in that process, I think it's, it's, it's something that's, that's worthy of our, of our support and our attention. Um, you know, uh, I think that, uh, uh, you know, again, that's not, that's an area where, where the bourgeois media and, and, and Western politicians uh, like to point the finger and talk about how China is generating debt diplomacy and all this, when in fact the vast majority of indebtedness faced by countries around the world isn't to China, you know, and China has been much more flexible and forgiving in its relationships, especially in the period of COVID and all this. Uh, than, than, uh, than, you know, the IMF and other other such Western agencies. Uh, uh, just to respond on two or three of the of the points, um, I mean, Kamal said that there'd always been a difference between China and the Soviet Union, and, you know, of course, to some extent that's true. But I think it's important that the Communist Party of China, I mean, now, more than a uh, point recently, clearly sees itself as being within the communist uh, tradition, uh, the communist tradition that began, uh, you know, in 1917, uh, effectively, uh, and as trying to learn from its history and develop a line with its history. I mean, Xi Jinping, in one of his first major speeches since after he became leader, just over 10 years ago, general secretary, was to say we have to study what happened in the Soviet Union. And he said that to dismiss the Soviet Union, to dismiss the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, to dismiss Lenin and Stalin is to engage in historical nihilism. Uh, and obviously a concern of the Communist Party of China is not to lapse into historical nihilism and or in fact to separate the reform and opening up periods of 1978 with the period of Mao Zedong before to see them as building the second upon the first and drawing on some of the lessons of the first. Now, Kamal's right that the capitalists have no party of their own in China. However, one of the things that was introduced under the three represents period was that capitalists could join the Communist Party of China. Uh, I don't think they've established any degree of ascendancy within it, but they have a voice heard within it. And this is one of the points I was trying to make, that China is a complex and contradictory society. Uh, and many of those contradictions are channeled through the Communist Party. They can go nowhere else um, uh, effectively. And this relates to the question of trade unions in China, which I've studied quite closely. When I went to China, it was to meet trade unionists uh, across China. 
Now, the trade unions, I don't believe, really function as part of the state in China, but they are under the leadership of the Communist Party. Situation very similar to trade unions in the Soviet Union and other socialist uh, socialist countries. I think that is that is flawed. We shouldn't expect them necessarily to be like British trade unions in every respect. There's a lot of labour disputes in China, and if you follow them, generally, the, the trade unions don't initiate them, but when they are involved in them, they try to mediate a settlement that gives the workers uh, something, at least. They play a part in the welfare system, not the coercive system. But I do think this is questionable. I think that's, that was a sort of model that may be rubbed along okay in a state owned economy as a, the closest Soviet Union. When in the, the, China, large numbers of people, millions, tens of millions of workers are working for private firms, it becomes more difficult. If you look at the present COVID disturbances, as I understand it, they began at Foxconn, uh, a place where the working regime is not something we would easily tolerate. Uh, and part of the issue seemed to be the failure of Foxconn to pay agreed upon payments in the context of a COVID lockdown uh, and so on. And here's a huge business intimately tied into uh, Apple and other com companies in the West. There, I think, independent trade unionism uh, is, or, or, or uh, trade unionism that can act decisively, because here you have a form of class struggle. Now, Mount St. Tung may have bent the stick too far in one direction of seeing class struggle lurking in every corner, uh, but the idea now that there is no such struggle in China is evidently false. I mean, you can empirically say it's false because the, the evidence of it is there the whole time. It's a question as to how uh, that uh, is channeled, how it is managed. And I believe there's a lot of tensions that, you know, is going to be resolved and new problems will arise as China finds its way forward. Uh, now, on, on the Belt and Road, I agree with what Ken uh, said. I think the main thing or a main thing to look at this is this is an uncoerced international economic initiative countries that are coming to agreements with china are not under any uh, military uh, political diplomatic or economic pressure to do so sometimes problems arise with the agreements that have been made and they have to be dealt with but this does not seem to me to correspond uh, to an imperialist um, uh, relationship a final thing i wanted to say is that uh, there is now a huge effort to work up a new Cold War against China. The most recent initiative of the Biden administration uh, to try and basically block all semiconductor uh, trade uh, uh, with uh, China uh, is, is really an economic declaration of war. I mean, it corresponds uh, somewhat to the uh, measures the Roosevelt administration applied to Japan before um, the outbreak of the Second World War in the Pacific in 1941. I'm not suggesting the same thing is going to happen as a result of Chinese initiative now, but it's a very, very uh, dangerous course that has been followed. And I think we have to mobilize against this new Cold War basis of defending every dot and comma of everything the Chinese government does. Much of the issues are their own internal affairs and they just need to be left at that. Uh, we don't need to you know, go to the trenches to defend every decision that's made. We don't need to reproduce in some ways the error of how we, or some of us anyway, defended the Soviet Union, uh, you know, of every, uh, uh, every dot and comma, because that's not necessary. What we have to do is to persuade people in Britain that a new Cold War is not in their interests. We're not opposing it as an act of philanthropy to the, the Chinese government, which in the end can look after itself. It's, it it's, uh, uh, has the capacity to do so. It's because it damages trade, it damages the economy, it damages the higher education sector, it stimulates chauvinism and racism. And all these, the price will be paid by people here in Britain. So in rejecting a new Cold War, we're not only uh, defending uh, multipolarity and the prospect of a more egalitarian world order. We're not only defending the right of China to find its own way in the world and to build its own different social system. We're also defending the best interests of working people in Britain. Thank you. Okay, so, uh, thank, thank you, comrades. Um, I'm going to um, ask Marion, I'm going to ask Carlos to say a few words just um, in, in closing in a moment. Uh, but this is a joint meeting with the Morningstar newspaper. So if you are 
not a subscriber to the morning star newspaper what are you waiting for it's about <laughs> the time that you were frankly um, and you can do so very easily um, online you can do it by just going to um, your local news agents and um, you can get it delivered to your door every day you can get it online if you prefer to do that but get the paper that's the main thing please get the paper let's um, use the the main organ that we have to help try and build um, peace and socialism um, in this country and internationally um, as well. Um, so please do that um, for us. Marian. Um, as those of you who don't know, the Marxism Library is a, a library and an archive of Marxism and the working class movement. We're on three stories coming up to our 90th birthday, and we've got this building jam packed full of um, working class history, including posters and pamphlets on China. We've actually got the China Campaign Committee archive here as well. Um, and we put on a, an education program, including events like this, um, evening events, but as well as workshops with schools. We're doing a massive new engagement program funded by the National Lottery at the moment. So if you're not already a member, join, look at our website. We've just put up our 2023 program today. Um, so do stay involved. Well, thank you very much, everyone. So just closing remarks, I would like to um, and to Andrew for what I think everyone will agree were, you know, really fascinating, really insightful, really thoughtful presentations and remarks. Um, so thank you very much for that. And we hope to cooperate you, with you further in the future. Thank you very much to Roger and to Iris for moderating and introducing with the <coughs> customary uh, professionalism and skill that we've come to expect. Um, thank you very much to the Morning Star and particularly to Ben Chaco, who's been involved um, in the organising this event from the beginning, and to Mark's Memorial Library and particularly Miriam, who's also been involved from the beginning. Uh, and thank you very much to the audience, all of you, for coming out on what's not a particularly pleasant uh, early winter evening in London. Uh, you know, China is an extremely important subject, it's getting more important with the geo geopolitical dynamics that we're seeing in the world and badly misunderstood and which there isn't enough you know, serious and useful analysis about. Uh, there's a gap that Friends of Socialist China was set up to fill, set up about a year and a half ago as a website and an events platform and social media platform to build understanding of and engagement with and solidarity with Chinese socialism. We've got a website, we obviously put on events, um, we've got social media, we've got YouTube, we've got a mailing list. Please sign up, sign up to the mailing list. Please, you know, uh, spread the work around, uh, spread work around that we do. Uh, we try to consolidate the best analysis that there is um, of China and uh, socialism and anti-imperialism in China. Um, and you know, we're a very small number of part-time volunteers, so if anyone feels particularly inspired to get more meaningfully involved, then please do reach out. We definitely need more shoulders to the wheel. But yeah, thank you very much again, and I hope we can cooperate further in future.